So welcome everyone to this session of SF24, 2022, about three levels of description building. And this work comes from my new book as of last year, The Next Generation Solution Focus Practice, uh, in which I not only, I consolidate, I think, a lot of the developments that have been coming. Some of them come from Brief and Chris Iveson in particular. Others come from other places. Some of them were even uh, presaged by Paul Z and I 20 years ago in our book, The Solutions Focus. Um, but I'm presenting solution focus as a, a description building practice. And I had these three levels, which are, they're none of them very completely new, but the way we put them together as three levels, I think is a really helpful one. So I want to talk about that for a bit today. Uh, I want to do a bit. And then if there's time, then we'll do an exercise. But my experience is there may not be time. Uh, but there'll be a chance for questions. And if you have questions, there will be opportunities as we go along. But if you just want to unmute yourself and shout out, I'm quite happy to, uh, to handle that as well. So I am now going to share my screen. Uh, and there we go. Uh, and by the way, of course, you, you're free to interact in the chat. I will you know, keep uh, an, as much of an eye on the chat as I can. If you'd like to say hi in the chat, say where you are. Uh, say what you do, then please feel free to do that. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Just give me a quick thumbs up if you can. Yes, thank you, yes. So, three levels of description building. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're talking about, we're going to talk about what we mean by this description building and the importance of all three levels in grounding meaning in the conversation. There'll be a coaching demo, there'll be questions and dialogue. That's my objective for today. And the real reason why I called this book The Next Generation of Solution Focused Practice, a rather bold description, I'll, I'll acknowledge, but I think there's been a shift. Now, Chris Iveson was saying yesterday that in a way, some things have changed and in a way nothing has changed. I think there's been quite a big change and it's a really important one and it frees us up. So here's the big change that I've seen in my 30 years of working with solution focused ideas. What are we trying to do? as solution-focused practitioners. Are we trying to ask the questions so we can hear the answers uh, uh, in order to construct an intervention? Or are we asking the questions so the client can hear their own answers, so they can change themselves with our participation? Uh, and I think there's been a, a shift across this spectrum over the last 30 years. If you go back to the very beginnings of SFBT, and Chris Iveson yesterday mentioned the book Clues by Steve DeShazer, the red book, which is a key text in this field. It, the answer is very clearly, we're asking the question so we can hear the answers to construct an intervention. It's very clear. But even quite soon, actually, um, Steve and Insu and others began to hedge their bets on this, I think. And so for quite a lot of the time, uh, people were kind of doing it for both reasons. And Steve Shazer in particular always, always ended, with, ended his session with an intervention, with a task of some sort. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but INSU particularly we got more flexible about this, I think. Uh, and other people too, Brief and, um, uh, we did this and Paul and I in the solutions focus we advocated not particularly giving tasks but mostly we advocated asking the client uh, what they what they were thinking of doing next um, just as a, a, a to, to move things along uh, but gradually people have begun to double down on this idea that we are asking the question so the client can hear their own answers and indeed, there was a very famous occasion at Brief when Steve DeShazer was visiting some uh, well, 20 years ago now, when a teenage client with a family noticed this and he asked explicitly to Steve, are you asking these questions so you can hear the answers or uh, so we can hear the answers? And Steve, in his way, coughed and moved on and, uh, and was hedging his bet. But what Brief have done and what I've been experimenting with and other people are getting to grips with now is this idea of what happens if we really commit to the idea that we're asking the question so the client can hear the answer. And of course, we need to hear the answers to construct another, another question and propel the, propel the dialogue forward, the conversation forward. 
but we aren't trying to construct an intervention. And I think that means we listen in a different way and we can respond in a different way. And the next generation of solution focused practice uh, is, is all about how to do that. And as I say, I think it frees us up. I think for one thing, we, if we don't have to design intervention, it's a lot of responsibility off our shoulders. And it frees us up to respond and go with the client more easily and more directly, as we'll see in, uh, uh, as the session goes along. And I just want to say that I'm not claiming that this is particularly better. It might be more elegant. And I think it, there is evidence that it, it could be quicker and more efficient. To do this and I find it a very satisfying way of working which is also important uh, but the, the 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 jury is actually still out research wise but the reason another reason for writing this book the next generation of solution broker practice was to lay out these distinctions such that research could be done and uh, I wrote the book because of my attendance at a conference in South Africa excellent conference in 2017 where there were some people talking in this kind of new language about noticing uh, and not no interventions. And there were other people acting as if it was 1989 and uh, doing it straight out of clues. And everyone was too polite to point out that these are actually two quite different forms of practice, I think. So I wrote the book to make these distinctions and help us be, be more specific and more choosy, if you like, about the kind of work we do. So the central metaphor of this description building practice is this art gallery. Uh, and there are various stories about how this came into being, but I like it very much. And I think it offers us a good framework uh, for our work. And if we say that the role of the, uh, the practitioner is to help the client build detailed descriptions, uh, then and these descriptions are like images in an art gallery in a way. So here's the gallery on the screen. We come in through the ticket office, and we have a conversation about something about best hopes or what's the project, uh, what do you want to talk about? You know, what do you want to be better in your life? Uh, some, usually something connected with the future rather than the past. Uh, and if the client wants something to be better, has a hope, that's good, because we can move on. We've got a ticket to go into the art gallery. And then there's two main rooms in the art gallery. One is the future gallery, and one is the instances gallery, which is, has images from descriptions from the present and the past. And there can be several different snapshots, images of, of, of episodes in these one day, the day after the miracle or, or a day in a better future. And there can be several different scenes in this day. And usually there are, there's usually a scene around waking up, there might be a scene around breakfast, there's a scene around you know, maybe going to work or something, there's a scene around meeting your family. There, there might be different moments in this day after the miracle. And I like to think of them as like different images on the walls of a gallery. And they don't all have to be the same size and the same level of detail, but, but we can assemble them. And then we can have the instances gallery where we have images from the present, which you can get to with a scale. Where are you on a scale from one to 10 right now? Uh, and how come? That's an image from the present or a description from the present. And then we can have times when things are going well in the past or you've been higher on the scale or whatever, and different episodes from the past can also come in along. Uh, and uh, so we, the main part of the work is helping our client build these, these detailed descriptions using these three levels of description building that I'll describe in a moment. And then finally, at the end of the session, we leave through the gift shop. And the gift shop has a chance of taking something away to remember the session, which might be a summary, an appreciative summary. It might be images of N plus one on the scale. Uh, it might be, who knows? But it's a kind of a chance to sum up and sum up and move on at the end of the session. Um, and I find this a very compelling way of working, which allows us to practice solution focus, but also leaves behind some of the baggage of the family therapy roots, like doing compliments at the end, which is a precursor of uh, offering a task that the client might want, not want to do, but it puts them in a good mood if you give them a load of compliments first. So these things were the result of family therapy background, Steve Insu and others. Uh, and the, it, now we're moving on. We don't have to do it that way. We can put compliments anywhere. Uh, we, can, uh, we can end the session in different ways. So lots about that in the book and detailed annotated transcripts of real sessions, which aren't perfect uh, to learn from. So here's our three levels of description building. There's the big SF questions. 
And I, if you're on this call, you probably know what they are. These are things like, what are your best hopes? Suppose there was a miracle, what would be the first tiny signs tomorrow that you notice? On a scale from one to 10, uh, uh, these, kind of, these kind of questions, and they, they usually kick off a chunk of conversation. Uh, in the, back in the old days, people thought these questions were important of themselves. Uh, and, uh, but, but now I think we see them as the beginning of quite a long piece potentially of work. And the trick is not to jump out of that piece of work too quickly. Uh, so, and as Chris Iveson uh, observed in yesterday's kickoff, Steve DeShazer didn't, I didn't always go for details at all. But I think there's a power to going for details as I outline why in the book and I, Chris does as well. So there's the big questions. Then there's the small questions, which are kind of description building questions. And I'll go into this in more detail in a minute, but they're questions like, what difference would that make? What would be the first tiny signs that that was happening? Who else would notice? What else? Or what, what next? What happens next? Uh, these questions are, th these are still part of, so each big question sets off a load, and lo a load of these small questions, which build the detail in the description. Uh, and these questions can be cycled around in, in all sorts of ways, almost indefinitely, until everyone's bored. And uh, Chris famously says that solution focus practice is about asking what else until you can't bear to ask it again and then asking it again. So uh, we so we have these these description building small questions. And then finally, the third level, the under underrated and under noticed level, in my view, the tiny joint engagement and participation of both parties. And what that looks like, particularly from the practitioner's point of view, is nodding, going, mm-hmm, or variants on that, leaning forward, smiling, saying yes, uh, summarizing, writing things down. In my case, I love to work with a, a, a pencil and paper in hand. But this tiny, 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 we might say we used to think they were encouragements, and they are encouragements. They're encouragements the client to keep going but they serve an even more important role as well. And that's what I really wanna focus on in today's session. So one of the key findings, and this is from the microanalysis people, Janet Bavilis, uh, Dominic and Elfie, uh, Harry Cormann and others. One of, they, they used to view solution focus practice or any conversation practice as a game of turn taking or turn making, my go, your go, my go, your go. But they've realized in the last decade that actually that's a, that's a simplification. Both people are participating all the time. Uh, but the participation may look like listening to a question, but it will look like listening to a question perhaps while nodding or leaning forward or, or doing something else. So it's not my go, your go. It's we're both at this all the time. And that's a really important shift to get our heads around. Uh, and this these three levels of description building offer us a clear description of what we are doing and why, uh, and not why we don't do the other things, or the other things that other practitioners might normally do, like look at the causes of the problem or uh, whatever that, that is. Okay, so let me just talk about these small description building questions, and, and anyone who's watched solution focus work in the last few years will have seen some of these, I'm sure. Um, four, four things you can do. You can prompt for detail. And that's one example of a detailed question is, what will be the first tiny sign that X is happening? So the client has said, uh, oh, I'd be feeling a bit more X. And X could be anything at all, specific or not. Uh, and you can ask, what would be the first tiny signs that that was happening? So you're, you're taking the client's word, actual word or phrase, and plugging it into this, uh, this description building small question. It's really important that you're not summarizing what the client says, you're taking the word or the words and, and playing them back with this detail uh, building question. There are other ways of prompting for detail. That's just one of the very common ones. Then you can prompt for interactions. What would person P notice that would tell them you were why? And so why is another word client has introduced? Oh, I'd be more confident when I walked into the office. Okay, so what would the receptionist notice? That would 
tell them that you were more confident. Uh, and these questions have been part of SF since the very beginning. It all goes back for even further to the interactional view of the Mental Research Institute uh, and the Bateson project before that were interested in these tiny interactions. But, but we can now see it in description building terms as a, a different sort of prompt, prompting for interactions. And the third one on the scale is prompting for consequences. What difference would that make to you? What difference would that make to person P? Uh, and, and, and those sort of questions. And the first one is prompting for the next element. And this is what else? Or what next? Or, or, or variants to that effect. And these aren't the only questions, the ways to ask for this, but, but these are, for, it seems to me, four very good categories of description building small questions. Uh, and then we have, why is, so, the, and I'll, I'll, show, I'll, I'll say this and then we'll have a little chat. So why is the third level so important? It's because of the grounding process. And this, again, comes from the work of Janet Babalas and others who look at how do we, if you like, agree meaning in an actual conversation? Uh, and Janet Bavilus, building on prior work of Herb Clark, proposes that it goes like this. This is simple, but, but broadly accurate. The speaker presents some information. So that's typically the client. Then the addressee displays that he or she has understood. That's typically the practitioner. But that's not all. Then the speaker has to confirm the addressee's display of understanding. So it's a three-part process. Client says something, practitioner says something, client acknowledges and accepts that, yes, we're talking about the same thing. Uh, and this happens in all sorts of complex ways, but let's look at a very simple example to start with. Uh, this is ploddingly simple, as I say in the book. A concierge, hotel concierge has been asked for the phone number of a restaurant by a guest. And the concierge says, it's 552-8262. And the guest says, perhaps writing it down, 552-8262. And the concierge says, yes, that's right. Yeah. The three parts in action, presenting the information, uh, accepting the information, and then confirmation of the acceptance. Now, that's ploddingly simple, and it actually happens in real life in much more subtle ways than that. And what I want to do is present you this transcript that's in the book. This is a transcript of Steve DeShazer uh, working with a client, where they are grounding information in a very solution-focused way, and we can see how it, more like it happens in real life. Now, there's three slides of this, and the actual dialogue takes 17 seconds, and I really wish I had a copy of the actual dialogue to play you the tape. I've seen the tape, but I don't have a copy of it, so apologies for that. But So you'll see that we, we go through the, the transcript, and then you see the grounding sequence presented in the middle column. And re in real life, grounding sequences can overlap. So the client says, uh, Steve has asked something about uh, what, what's the issue or something. And uh, the client says, well, right now I'm dealing with a drinking problem. That's the new information. And DeShazer says, mm-hmm. And anyone who ever saw Steve DeShazer work will be familiar with that kind of mm-hmm response. And that is a, a minimal way of displaying understanding. So he's kind of accepting that whole thing with this very minimal thing. And the client says, yeah, very softly. And that is the third piece of the grounding process. But the, after the first statement, the, first, the second two responses are both very minimal. So that we've grounded that right now, the client is dealing with a drinking problem. And then DeShazer pauses while looking down and writing and then says, okay, ah, uh, and pauses again. And the client then, starts to speak and the client says sometimes i drink and steve interrupts him and he says you say right now and this is more explicit acceptance of i'm dealing with a drinking problem right now which the client said at the beginning 
And the client says, well, I've been dealing with it. And so that, that, is, uh, that is more information confirming right now. So we've grounded that he's dealing with it right now. As well, he's, been, he's presented new information too, the client. I've been dealing with it. And then the last slide, and Steve DeShazer then said, mm hmm And then that displays understanding. And the client continues, but right now, I'm just feeling that it's the time in my life to really get into it, to do something about it. And that's another piece of new information. But it also accepts Steve DeShazer's uh, kind of uh, second point about right now. And so, and then, so we, now we've grounded that he has been dealing with his drinking problem as well as he's dealing with it right now. Now, you can't possibly do the work and try and think about all of that stuff at once, I think. Um, but it's interesting to step back for a moment and see what are the roles of these aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And also the way that uh, the practitioner, Steve Shazer here, is choosing which words to go to come back with. So the client starts off, uh, I'm doing, right now I'm dealing with a drinking problem. And then the first meaningful response, Steve says, you say right now. And of course, he's not picking up on drinking problem, which would be the problem folks invitation. He's picking up on right now. And the way that, that, that these, these little ahas, uh, mm -hmm's, noddings, writings, grunts, uh, these serve a purpose of grounding. So they're part of this way in which we establish some meaning shared between us in the conversation. Um, and I think they're really important, but they don't get into the books very much, this, this sort of stuff. So all three levels are important in my view. Uh, and these are the points that are emerging. And these points have probably all, always been with us. I can make no claim there are, that these are new, but I wanna lay them out as clearly as I can for you today. So first of all, there's more to the exchanges than simple exchange of questions and answers. Uh, it's not question, answer, next question, because the next question usually contains some element of the previous answer which grounds it. Then the second is that the grounding information is a joint activity between the client and the practitioner, that the practitioner is paying very close attention to the actual words used by the client, and a lot of this grounding happens in minimal responses like uh-huh, as well as repeating and reusing words. And finally, that the process of constructing meaning is a continuous one involving all concerned in the conversation. So we've got the three levels. We've got the big questions, we've got the little detailed questions, and we've got the continuous process of uh-huhing, responding, uh, nodding, etc., which plays an important part in the grounding of the meaning in the conversation. Right, so let's take a little pause there, and I am going to stop the screen share for now. And uh, that's a chance to, before we do a coaching demo, chance for uh, questions, comments, and whatever else people would like to offer. Matt is waving his hand around. Just jump in, Matt. Yep, just a quick question. You're talking about the micro expressions and that sort of mm. stuff. How would you relate that to telehealth? You know, the telephone talking therapy that solution focused is. I, I think I think you'll find it happens on the telephone as well, but it's even harder work because yeah. because because um, uh, you, to really ground the meaning, you need the three phases. This is what Janet Babos would say, and so on. The, but on the phone, you can't you can't do nodding. You can't do leaning forward. You can't do looking interested and all those other things that we, we do. And you have to, you do it verbally. So you have, you have to perhaps do it, do it a little bit more explicitly, I would suggest. But you have to be careful what you grab. That's the other thing. So I've been dealing with a drinking problem right now. You say right now. It's a, kind of, it's a choice. There's choice there. In, in any statement that a client makes, there is more to respond to than you can actually respond to in one go. So you always have to be picking. What are we going to go with? What are we interested in? What seems to be connected with the hopes and whatever 
uh, you know, that that's the kind of sorting process. But we have to also, we have to do it right there in the moment. You can't sort of have a push pause and go and have a think about it. <laughs> this is what we learn to do when we, when we do the practice, I would say. Okay. Other thoughts, questions? Just unmute yourself and shout out if you want to. Wolfgang. Thank you for the interesting conversation. I, I remember Steve in, in Sue at a workshop where both of them, or in different workshops, but I remember that they said uh, the intervention after the break is not that important that the, and that the change comes from the conversation yeah. before. Yeah. And they told us that they uh, learned this. So it's exactly as you said, the early SFBT and, and they already said this, the conversation before is more important. And I remember Steve said, Oh, the, the people don't do the you he called the task experiment yeah. later he, yeah. or i don't know but, but he said i remember him saying oh there's experiment you can do it or not or as you like and you can think about it if you do it and he said they never ask in the second session never ask for the experiment he, he did. and he says most of the people don't do this but they do something yeah. else it's and uh, and it's important if you do this kind of intervention break, it's important to use the words the client used before. Yeah. And yeah, and, the, and he said, it's not, it's not so, it's not important. Uh, the, 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 yeah, as you said, as you said, uh, this was the early one. So the development you speak about now is rooted in what they discovered and this, yeah. So, but yeah. thank you, thank you very much for, and also for this, for the microanalysis, which is very interesting, and the way to you 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 explain this, uh, very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Yeah. So Stephen Stephen Lindsay were definitely on this journey, but Steve in particular always did it, and they were well, they were aware. I think the task was less and less important, but they always did it because that's their tradition. I think. But uh, now people uh, like me and Chris Iveson and others are, are experimenting. What happens if we leave the task out? What happens if we even leave out asking about action? And as I think what, what Wolfgang says is, is, is right, that the client has changed themselves already, more or less, uh, during the conversation. So, so, so in a way, some of these other pieces, like the compliments and the break and the, and the, the task or the action conversation, these are a heritage factor, maybe, and they could maybe be left out. Um, I've got, there's a current comment, there's some bits in the chat. Uh, Klaus says, Deb Dana talking about polyvagal theory and the importance of neuroception for co-regulation, addresses some version of this third level as a vocal burst. Other call it paraverbal signs, yes. But, and, the, but, and I used to think, I think they were just about encouraging people. But I now see, thanks to this microanalysis, that they do more than just encourage. They, yes, they do encourage people. And once you've grounded something, you can build up. Um, but they also it plays this important role in grounding. And then we've got Jane, let's keep talking, says, I'm fine doing SF on the phone. I have to listen even more intently to the person and use their language in my next question to show I'm listening to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, the times, the very few occasions when we kind of ask a new big question, like we go on from the miracle question stuff to the scale, even then, we still want to be using some of their words, perhaps with their best mm -hmm. hopes in, in in setting the scale up. And Klaus also, oh, oh. oh sorry, yes, uh, Beatrice, go for it. Oh, yes, I just had a, I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, noticing, you know, ending on noticing mm. and what your thoughts are, because, um, you know, it could be leading the client into notice something in particular. Um, would you recommend just omitting task and noticing? Well, you mean there's a you mean a noticing task? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, it would be interesting to experiment with that. But if you're going to do some sort of task, then a noticing task is is the least the least invasive, I think. But we do lots of noticing language now in in the work. So lots of the questions are focused on what would you notice? What did you notice? Who else noticed that? What did she notice that told her that you were doing this? And it's all, it's the descriptions are phrased in noticing 
a great deal rather than in doing. And back in the day, if we go back to look at um, uh, Keir Clues, um, we see that a lot of the language is focused in terms of doing. What did you do? What would you do? Um, and the, no, but noticing is a precursor to doing, is my short summary of it. Uh, and so if you can notice something, then you know that it's time to do something. Um, and if you don't notice, then it's very difficult to act. So noticing, I think noticing is a nice way of, of, of as I call it, stretching the world. The client talks about what they would notice or what they did notice. And that makes them more aware of the importance of noticing those things. Uh, uh, at which point they already have uh, new ideas of what to do. Uh, and I, I came, one of these, I had one this realization one day, I was running a, a workshop with some complete beginners and we had a little exercise, which was about a kind of um, scaling question in, in noticing terms. And I, gave, and I had to make up the numbers. And so I gave this exercise to the, to the other lady who was just learning and she started reading the questions out and I immediately thought of new ideas for my shame. And so in a way there's a, there's a, it's, you know, there, there's a skill to it, yes, but at the same time, the questions do an awful lot of work if you get them, if you get them right and you just, you just get the questions. Um, now, I'm, uh, Matt has got his hand up again. Matt, go for it. Thanks. <laughs> um, just along the lines of that noticing as well, I've seen something new in the last six months in the terms of the language of solution-focused people in the conversations they're having, is that the question, not what what difference would that make, but what, what would be different about that? Why is that important um, kind of question? Um, how would that be different in terms of noticing? How is that important to you? And, and drilling in detail about noticing those things yeah. is that something new as well that you've noticed um i tend to avoid that frame myself because if you ask what would be different about that you're inviting the client to compare the new thing to the old thing mm -hmm. and, and yep. i personally would rather have them stick with the new thing um so, but hey you know let's experiment this is this is, this is the name of the game uh, I see it as one way of getting more detail, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of... well, for sure. And it's a way of getting kind of what's the important detail, for sure. Mm. Um, but what we don't want to do, and what people used to do way back when, is, is to say, well, they're talking about the day after the miracle, and people say, well, how is that different to what already happens now? And the intention was to kind of get the interesting differences, but what it, it forces the client back into the everyday world of the problem that we've just spent a lot of time beaming ourselves away from. So that's the risk, I think, with that. But hey, you know, let's let's try it out. Let's try it out. Linda has a hand up. Hello, Linda. Hi. Hello. Yep. Sorry, my video is not working, so no <laughs> you'll just have to talk to folks. And um, I was kind of interested. In, I think it struck me recently. I saw uh, Elliot Connie doing um, a solution focus session with a very young person, a seventeen-year-old um, boy man. Uh, and one of the things he did that I was really curious about, um, which kind of was something about how you manage to keep a conversation going in a solution focused way, was that he noticed that this young boy was really, really struggling with his questions to a point that perhaps it was he was losing that young person, I think. And what he did at that point was to ask this person some questions about his life. And through that way, somehow, um, reduce the temperature I don't know how you would describe it so that actually he could then reconnect and sort of ground I just sort of thought that there perhaps are also other things um, that don't get much airplay that experienced solution focused practitioners do in the process of delivering solution focus so I just wanted to kind of make a comment on that because it, it really struck me when we had the conversation and people asking questions afterwards he was able to give an account of why he did that and I was thinking gosh so it's something about you know getting people back on track and reconnected and then being able to ground in a way that so you notice you might be losing somebody and as an SF practitioner you do something in that space to kind of help get them back does that make sense I'm not sure if I explained that very well but I was, I was very curious about it and um, yeah. that's very interesting I mean I, one of the things that solution focused practitioners always used to do was our, do the thing the phase that was called problem-free talk 
um, uh, which was about trying to meet the client as a kind of rounded human being, uh, you know, with all sorts of um, upsides and downsides to their lives and relationships. Um, and I think uh, in the uh, some people now don't do that so much, but because you want to get on with the work. But I can see how if somebody is kind of and these questions are really tough, really tough. That's the other thing, particularly if you're jumping to a miracle question. These are hard. This is requires hard, creative thinking, you know, in a, a, in a new way that people probably haven't done before. And so, it, and you know, if, if I ask you these questions and even the small questions and people are saying, and people immediately have a pat answer. I'm a bit disappointed. What I really want them is to work. <laughs> and I'm saying, if they're going, oh, um, mm, ah, ah, yeah. I'm personally love that. Love that. I get very excited about that because because that's a mm -hmm. sign that they're kind of going to a new place, perhaps. Um, Absolutely, I think. But I think there's also a skill in noticing when when people are beyond us and actually yeah, not yes, and, and, that's and exactly, somehow being able to help them recover that's, to that that's space where they can work. That's um, exactly. The, that's exactly. And I think point, you know, yes. lots of different approaches. I think do that in different ways. But it it was it was very um, striking <laughs> for me yeah, um, watching Elliot do that's that great, and thinking, great, gosh, that's really point. interesting. Uh, David has his hand up. Yeah, just, just an observations chair, really. I'm sort of linking this in with um, stuff I've been reading from other therapeutic paradigms lately. And um, this model, this sort of three step model where the um, client confirms that the practitioner has understood them correctly. Um, for me, I think that's only half the story, because I think what's also happening is that they're um, they're sort of checking that they've said it right for themselves i think that that's another part of it so they might hear what their best hopes were coming from the practitioner and say no actually i don't want to be more x i want to be more y and, and i think that's quite interesting if we think of the point of sf questions is for people to hear their own answers yeah um and perhaps that could also say something from about answers to working and, and then they develop i think they really develop those answers as, as the conversation goes on i've seen that yeah. again and again and again um and what we don't want to do is get in the way of that, uh, that, that natural evolution of the meaning, I think. Uh, and sometimes it happens very obviously, and sometimes it happens kind of slightly quietly. But we have to be very alert. We have to pay attention and use the words that the client's with now, rather than perhaps the words that they were with 20 minutes ago and have moved on. Yeah, great point, uh, David. Thank you. Now, uh, a demonstration. I was going to do a demonstration, and I, and I will. So uh, who would like to volunteer to be uh, coached by me uh, in front of everybody, please? There's two in the chat already. Oh, uh, yes. I'm not sure whether they're volunteering. I think they're, they're wanting to see it. I, I wanted to see it. You want but to see if it. if nobody yeah, is, would you it. like to would you like to volunteer or would somebody else? But I can I could volunteer if so. We just wait for another four seconds if another yeah. lady or guy would. Another but, five seconds for somebody who would like to volunteer. But I I would also be willing to. Okay. okay, let's go with that. Then. Thank you, Wolfgang. Okay. Right. Now, everybody else, to help us with the de demonstration, I would like you, first of all, to turn off your video. You just do that in the bottom left-hand corner, do stop video. And then if you go to video settings, you click the little angle next to uh, the video, you can go to hide non-video participants. Uh, if you go to hide non-video participants, uh, and you turn your video off as well, Kenneth uh, and Vinay, then you'll just see me and Wolfgang on the screen. So uh, there we go. Thank you very much, everyone. That's great. No, Vinay, please turn your video off again. That's it. So you can now see both of us, I hope, and nobody else. Now, what I'm but I, I see, can I do this too? But I, because I see all the black screens. Yeah, if you go to video settings and turn off, Go to video settings and then click on video and hide non-video participants. That will happen too. Okay. Just a moment. Uh -huh. So we are just going to do a quick piece of coaching, maybe maybe eight 
eight minutes or so. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to start, uh, and I'm going to be using all three levels, of course. And I'm not doing it, I'm just doing what I do. But I'd like you to watch to look for the big questions, the small questions, and the third level, the tiny little micro um, uh, acknowledgements that help us ground the meaning. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and uh, Andrew, if you could help us by keeping an eye on the time, please. When we get to 12.51, please give me a shout. Or, see, 12.50, give me a shout. I've got some shout. Right, so Wolfgang, uh, what would you like to be more of in your life? Um, but, uh, but, uh, I would formulate the like list, but what I like to have more of is when I'm working in the office, I would like to be more uh, satisfied with myself working in the office, with office work. So I'm, I like to do workshops, talking to people, giving coaching, giving consulting, uh, but it's not so easy for me to work alone with the computer. And I like to have, I like to be more satisfied with my working in the office. You're more satisfied with your working in the office for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'd like you to suppose that tomorrow, when you come into the office, you notice that this is a day when you're going to be able to be more satisfied with yourself in your work in the office. What's the first tiny sign that you notice tomorrow that lets you know that this is going to be that kind of day? Um, tomorrow is Saturday. I think tomorrow the, 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 the miracle, the preferred future would be that tomorrow and Sunday I would not work okay. or I would not work a lot. Okay. So this is, a, this is part of the problem that I always on, on, on weekend, I said, ah, I have to work, I have to work. So I could talk about Saturday not working. Being or well, Monday, maybe Monday, maybe Monday. Okay. So I could. Let's, let's go but there also will be signs on. Let's yeah. go for Monday. Let's go. So suppose we're yeah. on Monday, and this is going to be a day when you can be more satisfied with yourself in your work in the office. What's the first tiny sign? In. Excuse me for answering it in another way. At the end of Monday. I would think, okay, it was maybe not perfect, but it was quite okay. So this satisfied. At the end of Monday, I would say to myself, I would think about what I did. And I would say, okay, this is, yeah. For example, if I would do a scaling question, I would say, okay, it's, it's clear, it's six or above. Mm -hmm. And so this is good in the way to be satisfied with. This would be it, at the end of Monday. And the very first sign, yes, uh, but this was a, would be a big sign. I'm, 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 I'm the boss, so I can decide what to do. This is a big problem. <laughs> and I will, maybe I would start uh, not that. Maybe I would start at at a reasonable time uh, earlier than usually. So, okay. so this would a, would a sign would be. That I would start. Okay. Earlier. Yeah. So what? So what time might you start if on a on a on a better day about being satisfied with yourself? Yeah, maybe it would be not. Um. um maybe at nine. Or, okay. And yeah. Who, who would or you maybe earlier. Be? I don't know. But nine would be. Nine would be good. Nine would be good. Nine or earlier. Yeah. What difference would it make? to you to start at nine or earlier? A big difference. Um, good question. Um, oh. Yeah, I would, I would say it. 
I think I would observe myself and say, oh, it's interesting. <laughs> How come? <laughs> because it doesn't matter. I'm self-employed. I can start at 10 or at 11. It's not, it doesn't yeah, matter. I have to do the work. But, so no. I would observe myself and say, interesting. Maybe I would think about the conversation with you. <laughs> With yeah. 40 people. So so I would observe myself and would say, would, uh, it's kind of wandering or, 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 yeah. And as you observe yourself, uh, what would you notice? When you just. I think I would start? notice that, uh, as I said, uh, I would wonder about, in a way, uh, and. Yeah, I think it would be, what would I notice? Oh, that's hard to answer. I'm wondering and it would be good. It would be good, it would be. And uh, and I would think about that, then I would be able to, 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 to end the working day earlier. So mm -hmm. I would think about, okay, then uh, I can, Make it at the end of the day, you know what I mean. Yeah, could be early. That I would say to myself when I would start at nine. So, yeah, I, I would think about the end. I would think about okay. at what time I will end the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what difference would it make to you to think about what time to end the day? Ah, this is a um, um, very very nice idea. Then I would think about what what I could do in the evening and maybe I would uh, tell this Marianne, maybe I would uh, speak to Marianne at what time I plan to end the day. <laughs> I think she well, I was, would I thought was, this very nice. Yeah. I was gonna, so I'm wondering, so Marianne is your partner, yes? Um, yes, she's my partner and my wife and, and my business partner too. She's my very, very partner in many ways. <laughs> so I'm wondering what uh, what would she notice before you started work at nine that would tell her that today was going to be a little different? <laughs> uh, maybe she would notice that I would uh, make the coffee for both of us. Maybe, um, but, but uh, maybe she would notice that I uh, would be more active in the morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More active. More she active. would, uh, I would uh, move. <laughs> I would move in the, in the office and in the, in the flat. I would move a little bit. Uh, but more dynamic. Oh. And what mm -hmm. would be the first tiny signs you were moving more dynamic? It's it's not so easy to speak about this, <laughs> knowing that forty people. <laughs> uh, um, um, I, 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 let me think about. Um, um, yeah, it's something about the. the Waking up in the morning, it's something about my, my self, something about my self talk, laying in bed. Yeah. And, right. And this idea, yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, we're, we're, at, we're, we're out of time. Uh, um, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Wolfgang. First of all, round of applause to Wolfgang uh, for offering to step in here now i want to give two things now first of all i want to give wolfgang a brief chance if you want to start your videos again by the way folks please do um i would give wolfgang a little chance to respond with his experience of the short conversation that we had then i want to give very briefly give you a chance to uh to talk to some other people about it what you noticed so wolfgang uh what how what was interesting for you about that Short, very short piece of conversation. Oh, it was good. It was good. I, 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 I honestly, I'm. 
I was in such a trance that I cannot uh, speak about something specific. It was hard to answer, uh, but because I know before that this will happen, and it was good. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, I cannot think about something specific, but uh, I really thought about this uh, Monday thing. And yeah, and it's like you said, it is is hard for the clients and very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you 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 talked you talked about a trance there. I'm, I'm I don't know if I call it that myself, but but there's a sense of being totally engaged. Yeah, you know, in a way that kind of uh, you, you that 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 is really interesting. I think with this. Um, thank you, Wolfgang. So what I'm going to do, folks, is uh, put us into some uh, breakout rooms now. Um, the the idea of this is just simply to have a chat for about uh, four minutes. With, uh, with some other people about what have you observed. Okay, so I'm opening the rooms up now. Please do jump in and just take a few moments to say hi to somebody else and to uh, uh, talk about what you noticed in that. So off we go. Please join the rooms. I've, um, I've just put it in the chat, Mark, but Klaus is a, is a wonderful wordsmith, came up with a beautiful comment where he said, we've, we've observed the evolution this morning from human being to human doing to human noticing. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was brilliant. That's lovely. Thank, Thank you, you Klaus. Yeah. Because yeah. noticing is a precursor to all the other stuff, in a way, I think. <coughs> Last chance before we wind up the session for now. Okay, so uh, I just let me share a couple of things then. So first of all, um, this is the activity that I was effectively doing, um, doing with Wolfgang, and I put it in the chat. Um, but please feel free if you want to have. A, this is such a great activity because it's so on the one hand it's so simple but on the other hand it's so profound and i put the instructions in the chat there please feel free to try it out if you're in a position where you're teaching solution focus or you're practicing solution focus with other people because you, this is um, this is such a great practice for first of all using the description building questions and secondly uh, uh doing the grounding thing as well uh, as you go along so uh, so do that um, a couple of other things. I've got a um, solution-focused business professional course, 16-week online course with the University of Wisconsin. Starts on the 23rd of October uh, and does, is coaching, working with teams, working with organizations, and a lot of digging into the background of solution focus. Uh, and if you want more stuff like this, then come and join me on that on that program. Uh, more detail uh, on my website about that. Uh, Mark, is it 2022 or 2023? No, 2022. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kaiser. Yes, it's 2022, uh, and there will be only one for the next 12 months. So, if you want to do that, uh, do that. And finally, of course, there's lots and lots of resources at sfwork.com. Uh, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn and you aren't, please do. I'm happy to connect with anyone who's joined in with one of these sessions. And also, um, I'm going to have a couple of other projects going at the moment, one about host leadership leading as a host and the other village in the city about neighborhood community building. So um, life is quite full for me in a good way for me at the moment. So um, that is uh, all we have time for. I'm happy to sit here for a few minutes 
uh, if anyone wants to have a chat, but we're going to wind up the session now and I'm going to switch off the recording. So thank you everybody for coming along. Right. I'm very curious about Monday. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> let, let us know. <laughs>